All right, welcome everybody. Uh, Levi Zitting, our fearless president, is not here tonight, so I'm going to do the opening. Uh, my name is Ben Pomerink. Yeah, I'm actually speaking tonight as well uh, in the perch. Um, but just wanted to call out some upcoming events in the community. Uh, so on the top level, we got speed networking with the Springfield Tech Council. I did just talk to the leader of the Springfield Tech Council. They do have some spots open. So if you're interested in doing that, it's actually tomorrow, I think, over lunch. Um, you can still sign up. Uh, Google Springfield Tech Council, go to their event calendar. It has all the sign-up information. Um, on the 11th, so is that next Tuesday, I think, um, is Open SGF Code Night. Uh, and then a week later is the actual demo uh, night. That happens, uh, I think it's a pretty regular cadence. Is it once a month? Do you guys know? Once a month they get together and do that, but if you haven't heard about it yet, go check out OpenSGF. Uh, they're on Meetup. Um, I think they might even have a website too. Uh, for Springfield Devs, uh, next month's presentation is actually going to be a, a panel discussion um, around work from home versus in office. Uh, so there's going to be a number of people for the community, uh, also like a Slido for uh, you know audience participation, question and answer. Um, is, and then just a general discussion about in-person work, virtual work, hybrid work, um, kind of everything in between. Um, and so that is a month from now uh, on the first Wednesday, I think, yeah, so May 3rd. Um, there's also another event coming up uh, called B-Sides Springfield. Um, the QR code is to get to the website. You can also just Google it. Um, it's actually May 20th, so it's a little bit longer lead time. Uh, it's a bunch of presentations about security and stuff. B-Sides is like a nationwide event, and there's a Springfield instance of it. So if you're interested in security stuff, check out B-Sides um, on May 20th. And then one more big thing I uh, encourage you all to put on your calendar. Uh, so Hack for Good is coming back this year. Um, if you haven't done it before, it's a community hackathon. Uh, we actually do it here at the E-Factory. Um, and uh, it, it's a chance to meet new people, work with new people, hack together some code that may make it into a system that helps a local nonprofit. Um, so it's a really fun event. Uh, it is a long event. It starts Friday afternoon and goes until Sunday afternoon. Uh, and there are a few people that make it the entire 48 hours straight. Um, I would not encourage you. I would definitely say go home in between. Um, but that is November 3rd through 5th. And then lastly, I uh, just want to publicly call for sponsors for the group. Uh, so Levi is actually taking over my role as the committee chair for events so that I can help drum up some sponsorships. So we have a lot of sponsors that have helped us in the past. It's been about a year and a half to two years before since we've called for sponsors. Um, so if you work for a company that has the ability to sponsor groups like this, um, we'd love you to, to reach out. Um, I think if you go to the website and click that become a sponsor, it says to reach out to treasurer at SGF Dev. Um, point people that direction. Um, keep an eye on Discord uh, for other announcements about sponsorship opportunities. Uh, really, we're just trying to make it so nobody has to pay to be part of the group. We do provide the pizza, um, and we also host the website. There's a few other things that the sponsorships help with. Uh, we have, hopefully, if you guys made it to the holiday party last year, that was paid for with the sponsorships, which was a good time. Um, so not a lot of money is necessary to keep the group going, but it does help, and uh, we offer some recognition to those sponsors. Um, so you can tell them your company could be here. So. And that being said, uh, we're going to get into the presentation part. So uh, I mentioned before uh, I'm presenting tonight. I'm going to be in the perch talking about Terraform, some really high-level ideas about why you'd want to use something like it, um, and some code examples. And Chris? I'm going to be talking about a year I spent in Web3, kind of the pros and cons of the industry, who I recommend it for, who I don't recommend it for, and some extra topics if I have time. So if you want to listen to Chris, stay put. This is where he's going to be presenting. If you want to hear about Terraform, come join me in the perch. Any questions? What's Terraform? Come listen to the talk. <laughs> no, uh, infrastructure is code tool. So cloud, cloud infrastructure, and it looks like code. 
Uh, it's a it's a, an alternative to cloud formation, but it's a very similar concept. Yep. Cool. All right. I'm heading to the perch. Nobody comes with me. Preview for the stream. What? The preview for the stream runs fine. Okay. But for some reason, the actual stream is just clipping all kinds of. It's just freezing up. And We're gonna have to remember this for next month then. People in the back, can you hear me fine? Thank you. All right, so let's get into it. So we will start with an introduction. My name is Christopher Bonick. I've been an engineer for a few years now. Um, over on the education side, I got my associate's degree in computer science from OTC. I then went on to get my bachelor's degree in computer science from WGU after working in the industry for a while. Over on the experience side of things, I started out as a full stack intern at SkyFactor, which is an education analytics company here in Springfield. Um, they're kind of a subsidiary of Macmillan Learning. So I stayed there for a while, eventually was promoted up to application software engineer, and then took a break, um, went back to school, got my bachelor's degree, and then ended up at NetSmart. NetSmart's a kind of health building company here in Springfield. They're all over, but they have a branch here in Springfield. So I worked at there for a while, and while I was working there, I kind of started delving into Web3 a bit. I worked with the smart contract programming language known as Solidity. I, I struggled with it, and so kind of dropped that, and then was eventually introduced to the Reach programming language um, for smart contracts. Went and got involved in their Discord and stuff, started asking questions, testing out new features, uh, making tutorials for them, and they ended up having an opening for a front-end engineer. And I threw my hat in the ring and ended up getting a job there. So that's how I, that's the one year I spent in Web3 was working at Reach Platform. Um, so who do, I, who do I kind of represent as this one year in Web3? So most of my experience at SkyFactor and NetSmart was front-end experience. SkyFactor had a bunch of different Angular front-ends, so I worked with those. Over at NetSmart, they had a TypeScript front-end, so I worked a bit with that. I would also say I kind of represent full-stack developers. So going back to SkyFactor, um, they had a variety of different back-ends. They had a Python AWS serverless back-end. They had a legacy Java backend. They had some PHP backends. So I kind of worked a little bit with all of those. Over at NetSmart, there are the um, Microsoft stack. So C Sharp, .NET, VB. Worked a bit with each of those. Got some experience with all of those. So that's kind of who, who I'm representing in this talk and kind of how my year went in Web3. So moving forward to the overview. So I'm going to start with some disclaimers and caveats, kind of the boundaries of my experience and stuff, move on to the pros of working in Web3, the cons of working in Web3, and who I don't recommend this field to, who I recommend this field to, and kind of circling back to those people I don't recommend this field to, talking about like how you could still participate in Web3 without making it your whole career. So moving on to disclaimers and caveats. This was the first startup I worked at. So if you see some of these points as being like, no, this is just the startup scene as a whole, not specifically Web3, then you're probably right. I only worked at one startup, which was Reach, Plat Reach Platform. Before that, SkyFactor, NetSmart, those were both corporates. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. This is also based off of my experience with one company within Web3, and Reach Platform can kind of look like an outlier because it's building and maintaining a smart contract programming language, which isn't the norm within Web3. However, my time there was spent kind of working on decentralized applications and building those, and that's much more the norm within Web3. I also won't be saying much about my past employer. They actually didn't give me an NDA, so I can technically say anything. However, um, 
I don't really have any complaints. It was a great company to work for, a great team to work with, and I enjoyed my time there. And that's pretty much it. Um, last but not least, things could be very different in the industry now, and probably are. It's been six months since I left Reach Platform, and the industry is kind of going into a bit of a bear market with how kind of crypto is going. It's going a little bit back up lately. We'll see if that translates into the industry um, leveling out a bit. Moving on to the pros. So right off the bat, I would say great pay is a pro of working in Web3. So kind of starting out with my initial um, job at Reach Platform, I was immediately making more than I was making here, working here in Springfield. And part of Part of my perception of great pay might be due to the fact that I live in Springfield. It's a lot lower cost of living here, so maybe the pay isn't actually that great. Um, but I would say it, it's definitely great if you're working in Springfield. It's more than I would have been making for a long time working for a company in Springfield. Um, moving on, another pro of the industry that I see is it's mostly remote. A lot of Web3 companies are Pretty much they don't have a physical location. Case in point, when I was working at Reach Platform, it doesn't have a physical location. It's just a bunch of people working at a remote company. Another pro is Web3 is kind of at the cutting edge. So you're working with more experimental technologies, and the benefit of that is you kind of get something that you don't get in the traditional industry, which is you get to be a trendsetter. You actually get to set the patterns and standards that other people are going to be following because you may be the first person building an application like this. And so I definitely see that as kind of a plus. I also put global here. So this is kind of to describe the workforce you're going to be working with, your coworkers and stuff. So case in point, the team that I was on, we had engineers from Shanghai, Ghana, Argentina, people there from Brazil. And it's just really cool to kind of work on a team with all these different cultures and hear about all these different cultures. So I added that as well. I put maybe conferences on here. So there's a lot of different Web3 conferences that go on. Um, and maybe your company will sponsor you to go to them. I, the company that I worked for did. I just didn't really feel like going in to any of the conferences. They do look pretty fun, look like they have good food too. So if that's a plus in your book, then that's a plus. I also put open source here. This one I see is huge. So the Web3 industry is leans very heavily into open source. Like if you were to look at the top 100 cryptocurrencies, I would bet you $20 that 80 plus percent of them are open source to some degree. Like either they have their full code base on a public GitHub somewhere, or they have part of it on a GitHub somewhere, or they're gradually migrating all of it to open source repositories. And that's huge because normally when I shift from job to job, I'm going to have to make a portfolio and build up a bunch of side projects to prove that I know what I'm doing. Whereas if I work here in the Web3 industry and my company open sources their code, I could just point my next employer back to all the work I've already done. And they have kind of me on the ground modifying code, editing code, making pull requests, all that stuff that they're looking for to get an idea that I know what I'm so those are the general pros and stuff. Uh, moving on to the cons. Like right out of the gate, the first con is stress. So this incorporates a lot of different things. Like part of it is the experimental technology, and that's going to kind of come up with the at the cutting edge making a reappearance here. Because you're just at the forefront of things, there isn't there isn't that established knowledge that there is working with other languages. So like Python, Java, these languages have been around for decades, whereas in Web3, the language has been around for five years, maybe three years. There isn't anywhere near the level of tutorials, anywhere near the level of Stack Overflow questions or anything like that. And that's going to turn it, that changes how we code in that we can't rely on that. And we're kind of just going out into the dark and trying to find a path. And that makes giving estimates for deadlines a lot more difficult because we don't know just kind of how quickly we could build the thing because it's experimental. And yeah, at the cutting edge kind of played into that. Um, and there's another facet to that as well. Like some of you have probably heard about the programming 
the programmer who introduced the concept of null and like the regret he feels over that because of the damage of that concept to the industry. And that's something that could entirely be possible by getting into Web3 is that in the process of you setting a standard that other people are gonna look up to, you could have made a mistake. And that mistake could just live on for decades. Another con that I kind of see is that right now Web3 is mostly startup. There's a few established companies that have more of a corporate environment, but for, for better or for worse, most of the companies out in Web3 are going to be startups. And they bring with that all of the negatives and positives of startups, of which I would, I think I could safely argue there's more negatives to a startup than there is positives. Personal opinion. Um, I would also put benefits as a maybe. So these being startups, they may not have all of their ducks in a row yet, and that might mean that in joining them, you're going to have to go and look for um, an insurance broker to get insurance and all the other things that more of a corporate setting would already provide. There's also the possibility of overtime. Now, granted, salaried positions all bring with it the, pro the prospect of overtime, but kind of going back to the at the cutting edge and stuff like that, with working with experimental technology, the difficulty of giving deadlines and stuff, the possibility of overtime seems more likely. And then this next point, a volatile industry, this has two facets. So the first is within six, I think six months of me joining, um, I had already heard of two other companies that were working on projects similar to ours, um, and their whole dev teams had just left. like. It sounded like there was either tension with management or the CEO had done something really dumb and the best option for them was just to leave the company. And so it's definitely something to consider getting into this is like it's not, it can be an unstable job. And the second facet to that is this is cryptocurrency. Like the market goes up, the market goes down, VC funding can dry up like that and then you're looking for a job next week. One of, the, one of the major cons is this next one, um, handling money. Now, granted, crypto isn't money, um, but it does have value, and you're dealing with that value. So there is, there is no shortage of stories of someone making a code mistake, which in a different application would just mean the feature is messed up or something has to be rolled back, but in crypto it means millions of dollars just got deleted. And that is... That is a big con, because normally we don't have to deal with that. And then last but not least, it may be legally gray. So crypto isn't new. It's been around for a while, but that just shows how long the law takes to catch up in that it's still not like legally sound, like spelled out, here's the parameters of crypto and kind of what you can do, what you can build, what you shouldn't build, and stuff like that. And so getting into the industry, you kind of have to be people prepared for your company can be audited by the SEC tomorrow and you're going to have to answer a lot of questions and stuff or get a lawyer or both. Okay, so that's a quick summary of the cons of it. Moving on to who I don't recommend this field to. Um, based on all those things, stress, volatility, poss higher possibility of overtime, possibility that benefits just aren't there, possibility of it being legally gray. I can't recommend this to parents. Like, if you have a spouse, you have kids, um, just get that boring corporate job, spend more time with your family, It's my recommendation. And that kind of goes with people with spouses as well. Just get that boring corporate job. Yes, you may not make as much, um, but you'll have more time with your spouse. And really, anyone concerned about ending up on the wrong side of the wall. It's just, it's a very legally gray area and you take that risk if you join it. What? What? I have to try and reach towards the screen. Okay, shall I wait? Yeah. Okay. Anybody have any questions so far? Yeah, what's up? Do you see all, <coughs> all those things happen, or any of those things happen to you personally, like some uh -huh. of the cons and all that kind of stuff? I saw the stress factor, um, not so much kind of the legally gray factor, like we were never approached by the SEC or anything. Um, hmm. 
I did kind of see going back to this last fee, last slide of not recommending it to parents. I did see parents there who, um, like they were struggling, like trying to balance family life and just the demands of a job like this. It's it's difficult. Yeah. Oh, anybody else? So um, that is a good question in that you can still structure programs in such a way that they're able to lock up funds. This is actually, I'm going to go on a tangent and promote REACH right now. Um, the REACH programming language is actually set up to prevent this to a degree. So it runs, it's kind of set up in the same way that, um, I don't know if I could fully say this. It's set up in the same way that some functional programming languages are set up so that they will essentially automatically generate automatically generate unit tests to make sure that no funds are left over in kind of smart contracts so that they can't get locked away, that you can't just delete money. However, other smart contracting programming languages do not have those safeguards, and so you can still make those mistakes. And that, that takes multiple forms. Like some of it could be locking money away in the contract. Some of it could be you've just made a contract so complex that you aren't aware of the gaps in it. And then a hacker is able to come in, exploit those gaps, and withdraw all of that money. So it could either be locking it away, it could be getting hacked, and probably a few other um, options and stuff. How's it looking, Dave? Uh, anybody else got any questions? Yeah, I had another one that I didn't refer back to. Um, sure. Uh, so I guess the question is, what are the pros and the cons? Um, So there's, there's documentation on Reach, um, and there's like um, some tutorials included in the documentation, so that's kind of where I picked up on it. It's definitely a lot slimmer than like the documentation other, on other programming languages in that you can find tutorials and stuff about it. So it's, it's a bit more difficult to learn. It was pretty much through word of mouth. Like I heard about Reach um, through a Twitter post, and then kind of tested it out from there. And then from there, I was a I found out about their Discord, joined their Discord. Um, after being in that Discord for a while, they did a job posting, um, a bunch of job postings, and that's where I found out about the job. In, yeah. the job, in Discord, they posted the job. In yeah. In yeah. Space. Yeah. And there are. Um, like Web3 um, job boards and stuff out there. And there's Web3 contracting companies and stuff that look for talent and stuff. So there's, there's a number of different ways to find them. We didn't run into that problem exactly, um, but we ran into the problem where like the feature was so new that the, the documentation was just very thin. Um, and I guess I kind of misspoke there and should have said like it's not that the documentation doesn't exist, it might just be so thin 
And so to thin to the degree that you actually have to like look into the code base to figure out how the feature works and stuff. Yeah. Dave, should I just continue or? <laughs> Okay. Someone else was going to say something? Um, I'm just thinking, like, the documentation exists. It's just not great. Like, something like that. Well, I'm not sure if it's not great or it's just, um, there's so many, there's so many prerequisites <coughs> in understanding the different documentation. So, like, let me see if I can figure up an example to back that point up. I would say it's not that the documentation exists, but it's not that great. It's that the documentation exists, but it's so new that it's not that great. Because it's kind of, it's only been reviewed once, in a sense. Whereas, like, if we think about the Python documentation, that's been around for how long? And so it's had a lot of time to be pruned and modified and fixed and made more readable and stuff. It's open source reach. Yeah. And then there's a consortium where someone, how, how, how are those resources sort of refined or say built, that kind of thing? Yeah, so the reach programming language is open source, and then the company reach platform maintains and builds it out. So, I see. Okay. Yeah. And now is there a profit model where they, they will sell, develop for somebody, and then but they maintain the open source platform? I'd, I'd have to ask him. That's fine. I just so. yeah. Good question. Okay. I'm just going to keep on going then. Okay. Let's see. Where were we? Um, okay. So who do I recommend this field to? Sinks? So single income, no kids. Um, you don't have as many uh, responsibilities, parents and stuff. And so you could kind of take advantage of that great pay, mostly remote job, working at the cutting edge, setting standards and stuff like that, um, while still dealing with all the cons and stuff. I also put maybe freelancers up here. Um, I'm not a freelancer myself. I only know a few freelancers, but I know that they kind of deal with those things like stressful jobs, um, difficult deadlines, kind of the volatility and that they need to find where the next job is and stuff like that. So I would assume um, that they'd be able to do pretty well in this field. So what about going back to the people that I recommended not join the field, um, what can they do? So I would recommend that they, if they want to participate in Web3, that they kind of just volunteer. Um, so a lot of these projects have um, discords and tutorials and platforms and stuff that you can go out and you can kind of meet the community, work with the technology, um, join their Discord, see if they need help making tutorials or writing articles or beta testing new features or being a mod or stuff like that. And in addition to um, recommending this to the people who don't really want to dive fully into the field, but also recommending it to the people who are thinking of joining the Web3 field full time because that's kind of a great way to get your foot in the door. So it's how I, I got my foot in the door is that I kind of joined the Discord, asked some questions, tested out some features, made some tutorials, and then when they had job openings available, I kind of had a reputation built up that was able to ensure that I, well, improve my ability to, oh, crud. One second. Improve my ability to get the job. Okay. Um, so that's that's the first part of the talk, uh, and I know I just asked you guys a bunch of questions. Do um, you have any additional questions? Yeah, so one of the things that um, they came to me about was, or well, they came to the community and I volunteered, is testing out a new feature of the language. Um, I think it's called Parallel Reduce, but it's a specific feature of the language that allowed for more complex smart contracts. And so I tried building a program with that. Um, and then moving on from there, I made some basic tutorials 
for kind of standing up the uh, reach programming language, integrating it into a bunch of different front ends, so like Svelte, Angular, um, React, and just plain JS. I do not. I've, for me, that, that stress point was kind of the um, difficulty. Like, I spent a year there trying to get used to the pace of things and realized I just, I preferred a more corporate setting. What do you think the most Yeah, so to the best of my understanding, China is using their own kind of, I believe it's closed source blockchain. Um, and I don't know if we really face any competition from that yet. That, that kind of gets more into a geopolitical question um, due to that. So Web3 isn't really like united enough to have a unified philosophy, but I would say like the presiding philosophy of Bitcoin would be the dominant philosophy of Web3, which is just trying to build a fi build financial system and financial products that aren't tied to governments. So kind of independent financial networks. All right, if there's no more questions, I'm gonna head on to the extra part of this talk. Okay, so these are just a few extra topics I brought together to kind of talk about um, things that I wanted to talk about. So starting out, um, kind of going back to that point about the industry being so open source, it kind of gives us a, a test run of this idea I keep on hearing popping up about like, oh, if, um, if we force tech companies today to kind of be open source, then that would reduce monopolies like F Facebook and Microsoft and Google and stuff like that. And while Web3 isn't a great example of kind of like testing that philosophy due to um, the various facets of it, it does give us a kind of an answer to whether that would work or not. And sadly, the answer is yes and no. So going to kind of starting with a no, that it's not going to solve monopolies and stuff, we go to probably the most recognizable cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin, and that that has been open source since, I believe, the beginning. Um, it's had just a ton of time for competition to show up and take its place, and none of it has. So there are tons of forks of Bitcoin going in all different directions, going in the security direction, going in um, the joke direction with Dogecoin. Um, in a bunch of different directions. And they litter the top 100, the top 200, the top 300, but none of them have taken the place of Bitcoin. None of them have um, kind of replaced its stranglehold over the market. And people chalk that up to kind of first mover advantage. It got the head start, and so it stays a monopoly. But then there's also the answering of, the, the answering of that question of, um, does open source break monopolies? And there are parts of Web3 that prove that can be the case. So one of those is um, one of those is called Bancor. Bancor is a DEX platform. We could think of a DEX as a decentralized exchange, as a kind of consignment shop for cryptocurrency. So Bancor comes out with the idea for the DEX. Um, they open source the code. And then along comes Uniswap, and they take that idea, and they refine it, and they make it so much more efficient. And now, if you look in the top 20, you're probably going to find Uniswap, whereas if you look in the top 100, you're not going to find Bancor. It's even further down than that. Um, it's still around. It's still making updates and stuff, but it did not become a monopoly, even though it had the head start, even though it was the first mover. Okay. Um, and this is a fun one. So Magic the Gathering versus Splinterlands, a uh, Web3 game comparison. So I played Magic the Gathering a bit. It's a card game. Um, I played the card game for a bit, and then I played the desktop version of Magic the Gathering. But then I've also played um, Splinterlands, which is kind of a Web3 card game. And they 
give a they give a pretty interesting example of like how does um, Web three change a game. Splinterlands is a lot more simplistic than Magic the Gathering in that it's an auto battler. So you'll put together a hand of cards in sequential order, and your opponent will do the same, and then you'll have them fight each other, and whichever one is left standing, that's the person who wins the match. However, there are a lot of parallels between it and Magic the Gathering, especially when it comes to monetization. So Magic the Gathering, if you've played the desktop version, you know there's all the trademarks of monetization. There's the daily rewards, there's the competitions, there's the seasons, there's all of that feeding back into a store to convince you to kind of buy more cards, buy more packs, and ideally use real money to buy those things. And Splinterlands is kind of the same, like it has daily quests to, that you can do daily, it has a leaderboard, competitions, all of that, again, feeding back into a store where you could buy and sell cards. Now that buy and sell thing is what sets it apart from Magic the Gathering, in that all the cards that I collect in Splinterland, I could then go on and sell to other players and stuff, or instead of a direct sale, I could just sell them through the store. However, I don't see this as kind of giving it an edge in any way, due to the fact that, yes, while I can take some of the time that I put into Splinterlands, turn that into money, and then go like buy a pizza or something, there's just an insane amount of complexity with doing that. So. First up, I need to find a buyer of either the deck of cards that I put together or I need to dump them all on the Splinterland store and hope that people buy all of them. And both of those things are going to take a ridiculous amount of time. Then once I've done that, I've turned it into a different kind of uh, token for Splinterlands and stuff, which I then need to, if it's possible, send it to something like Coinbase and turn it into cash or if something like Coinbase doesn't have that token, I need to send it back to that decentralized exchange mentioned, turn it into a different cryptocurrency, and then move it over to, um, what's it called? Something like Coinbase so that I can turn it into cash. So I finally do that. Along the way, I incur transfer fees and possibly exchange fees if I need to use a DEX, and probably also exchange fees for Coinbase as well, and I'm still not done because now I need to go and take taxes out of that um, out, of, out of that cash and pay the taxes on my earnings. And so it's just a really, really complicated process for getting a bit of money back from the time I put into the game. So I thought that was an interesting example with sharing of kind of a Web3 game versus a similar um, traditional game. And then we have now this one. This next one's pretty interesting. So this is this is one of the pros that I left out of um, that is in Web three. You get to see all these interesting experiments happening, kind of in with different technologies and stuff like that. And so there was this um, this art marketplace on a particular blockchain. It was called Hen. It was actually called Hicket Nunk, but I'm not saying that over and over again. So Hen was kind of moved along, um, starting to build up a bit of an audience and stuff. People were coming on, they were selling their art and stuff. And then for some reason, the owner just walked away and took down the website with it. Um, and in most cases, that would, have, that would have been the end of it. The website's gone, the hen is gone, and the community just needs to go and find a different art, art, art marketplace. However, Due to the fact that the code base for HEN was open source, um, the community was able to take that and kind of stand back up HEN under, I believe they named it TIA or something. And normally that would still not be a benefit because it's just a shell. It doesn't have any data in it. At that point, you might as well go and just, um, just go find a different art marketplace and start over. However, due to the fact that the data was publicly owned, it was on the blockchain, all of that data repopulated the shell, and the entire community was able to just go on as though nothing happened. And so it's an interesting example of kind of an application being able to be resurrected by a community, provided the code base is open source and the data is publicly owned. 
And then last but not least, macro trends within Web3. So this was some charts that I put together um, over the course of, well, about a year ago, I think, around a year ago. And it was just to kind of get an idea of the direction that the industry is moving in. And so I went to, I believe it's CoinMarketCap has historical data on the top 20, top 100 actually. And so I went and I took the top 20 cryptocurrencies and kind of broke them down into categories. So we have Bitcoin and the like up there, infrastructure chains. These are things like Ethereum that you could build dApps on top of or make coins as part of. Then we have um, stable coins. These are things like USDC. They maintain a one-to-one -one balance with the US dollar through a variety of means. You have meme coins like Dogecoin, XRP, which I don't really have a succinct explanation for, uh, data storage, um, tokens and stuff, privacy tokens, and then this giant miscellaneous category because every other token besides those ones had their own individual category. So that was February 2017. And if we jump forward five years to February 2022, the industry has changed quite a bit. So now infrastructure chains have just blown up. They make up 50% of the top 20. Stable coins have also blown up. They make up 25% of the top 20. And the only remaining parts are um, Bitcoin, XRP, and meme coins. So I saw that it's kind of interesting to see the direction that from a bird's eye view, the industry is kind of going in. So those are some extra topics I had. Hope you all have enjoyed the talk. Thanks for coming out. Sorry it's so short. I am very bad about giving very short talks. But yeah. They could just log in. So how it would work is um, you would stand up the shell of the application. Um, someone would go and kind of visit the application and stuff. And it would populate the data from the blockchain into the application. And so because they had deleted the shell and not the blockchain, all the data was still there just waiting to flow back into the application. So as each person came back in, it was all coming back together basically? Yeah. They just connect their account and then their profile's there. And I might be oversimplifying it. Um, I haven't delved too deeply into it. I've just read a few articles about it. Who pays for all the hardware that runs all of the, all these applications? Or yeah. Yeah. So um, it kind of depends on the application. So if you're going a as decentralized as possible method, um, you're probably going to look at something like IPFS, um, which is interplanetary file storage. It kind of has its own incentivization structure for people to stand up storage nodes. Um, and then people could put websites on those storage nodes and visit those. However, that limits the application to a degree because that means it needs just a front end and a kind of connecting to the to the blockchain. You can't have a back end with just a storage node. Um, but then there are a lot of companies and stuff and projects and stuff that are much more centralized, like they'll host their stuff on AWS or something like that. And so there's kind of a gradient of um, from as decentralized as possible to as centralized as possible. Does that kind of answer the question? That well, somebody has to pay for all of the running, the servers that are running. Yeah. And so, what's the revenue? How, how does the revenue stream work? I mean, I'm trying to think how that, is there, is there a way to generalize it, or is it very? So that kind of goes back to the fees that I mentioned with the whole Splinterlands thing. Like, um, for the running of the blockchain, all the nodes are kind of incentivized by collecting fees for transactions. So if transactions are being made, they collect a fee, and that's how they stay incentivized. Okay. Yeah. Is it kind of like mining your Bitcoin? Um, for infrastructure chains, it's, 
It's very similar to that, but I think it is a little bit more complex. Provided, provided you've um, kind of optimized it correctly. Like a lot of places, they go to where electricity is cheaper um, so that their, their net um, income is higher than their, well, their gross income is hiring than, higher than their operating expenses. like to see them try and put one on a 1970s mainframe. <laughs> you say that again, like essentially AWS, but it provides nodes to come? Well, like, like in a traditional like Web2 application, I'm, I'm going to send my data, my stuff over, and Amazon's going to have the hardware that runs that. With Web3, is it just whoever's interested in that blockchain, whoever wants to try to make money off of providing that node, or whoever just wants to provide that node that provides the storage and stuff that we are putting the data on? Yeah. For the node side of it, for the website side of it, you need to find a hosting service, and same with the back end. You mentioned a couple of times how like, working in Web3 can get you on the wrong side of the wall with like, getting audited and stuff like that. And just, you mentioned that it's mostly due to like, the lack of like, legal parameters around it. Do you think having those legal parameters and like, more government, I don't want to say like, oversight? Like, I think it's. I think it would help it in a sense that it gives it. Um, it gives it legal protection and a means by which to operate in. Like I think one of the things holding it back from us being able to get paid in cryptocurrency is because there is no legal framework. As soon as you could be paid in cryptocurrency just by any of your provider, um, any of your company or something or having a translation service, I think that would change the industry dr drastically. So that's, that's kind of the justification is that when you're getting paid in stable coins, you don't have that um, effect of being paid in Bitcoin where due to increases or decreases in the price, your taxes are going to be different from when you received it to when you have to pay taxes. Whereas if you paid, a paid in a stable coin, you p got paid in $2,000, tax season comes around, and you it's still $2,000. So I think that would be because the point is like do whenever I lose that money, it's gone because it's a big one. So not financial advice. Um, but I think when you sold that, if you sold it for five thousand, because there's the record of you receiving it at sixty thousand, you'd actually be doing um, I believe it's called tax loss harvesting. Because it's I believe it's the same with uh, stocks. Like if you get a stock and it tanks and then you sell it. Um, because of the decrease in value, you're kind of able to claim a loss on your taxes. Also, not financial. <laughs> So 
this is the interesting thing is just because like it's not in the top 100 it could still fly like if you categorized all the companies in the u.s um into a top 1000 or something there'd still be a market for all of these much smaller companies and there's still a market for Bancor. they just came out with version 3 a while ago um so they still have an audience and they're still doing fine they've just scaled to the size of the market Um, I think that might be a way to look at it, is that there's plenty of room in the market, and when, um, even though you there may be multiple DEXs and stuff, the different DEXs can find their own niche. There doesn't just have to be one. Yeah, so infrastructure coins like Ethereum and stuff are um, built to kind of allow people to build decentralized applications on top of them and also to kind of build new coins on top of them. So um, in the case of Ethereum, they're ERC-20 tokens, and people can just build an ERC-20 token. It lives on the Ethereum blockchain, um, and it can be used with Ethereum dApps and stuff. So let's see. Um, my theory as to why they are increasing so much is because of the ability to build decentralized applications on top of them. They almost become their own, um, own platforms in a sense. And there's just a variety of applications you could build on top of them. You could build social game, you could build social networks, you could build um, games, financial applications, financial applications that function in a sense like um, banks to a degree. So in the case of banks, we put money in the bank. Um, they use it to lend out, um, gain interest on that lending, and then they give us a small piece of the interest and stuff. Whereas if you're dealing with a smart contract, you can have that whole system of the bank entirely automated. And so it's so much more lean. Um, and that allows you to give kind of a lot more money in the form of interest back to the lenders, which are the people putting their money in the bank. So I think that's kind of where people see the promise is that their platforms and their platforms that people are building up more and more on top of. So I've dealt with a few of them. Um, some of them, they take like more of a hardline approach to um, social networks. So there's this one called Hive, where you have to pay to post. And the idea there is that it limits the post to higher quality content because people are actually having to pay them to post the content. Um, then there's ones that don't take that approach, like uh, Mines, um, which is another blockchain based uh, social media platform and their kind of thing is you have tokens you get tokens for making posts that drive um, feedback and stuff and then with those tokens you're kind of able to boost your posts essentially get them advertised and stuff and so there's just a variety of different ways that you're able to incorporate blockchains into social media to drive like incentivize different content or decentivize other content stuff like that Essentially, yeah. Okay. Don't get paid in Bitcoin. <laughs> Unless you're really prepared to get paid in Bitcoin, don't get paid in Bitcoin. Very cool. Well, unless you know the market's going to explode, I guess. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's great. That's not as interesting as the other ones. But the other one is you're, you're asking, or you're, you're talking about monopolies. Like, does the open source nature prevent monopolies? Because I was just making you think about, like, human nature. And it seems like humans are, um, you know, we like the Thing for Web three, making a more 
Yeah, so I don't, I don't fit reach into the same category as Russ because it's kind of trying to do something a bit different. So um, have you ever dealt with React Native? Yeah. So kind of that ability for you to build from one code base, a React Native code base, and then deploy on iOS and Android. I see that as more of what Reach is doing, is that you code a Reach contract, and then you're able to deploy on multiple blockchains. Now, there are benefits to that, benefits in that you have one code base, but they it kind of um, shares the same cons as um, React Native applications do, is you're really leaning on the optimization they've done to make sure your application is performant whereas more native applications are able to more finely tune their applications to be more performant on their specific platforms. Well, yeah, and we could kind of see that as um, there are already are monopolies in Web3 and that we have Bitcoin, we have Ethereum and stuff. And even though they are open source, they still haven't been usurped in a sense. Now, granted, what seems, well, it's a difficult thing because on one hand, um, companies are not fixed things. And so companies can kind of get lazy and then someone else comes in and takes the monopoly from them. And you kind of have that same thing with cryptocurrencies, is that they can get old and unperformant and stuff. Um, but because of the nature of cryptocurrencies and stuff, they can be upgraded. And so even if they become unperformant and other people can get an advantage over them, um, they could still be replaced. I would, I don't know if I've thought about it that much. Um, because it just becomes more and more scarce of a resource, I guess the hypothesis is that it becomes more and more valuable. However, we are kind of waiting to see if that actually happens. And there's actually some interesting um, experiments, kind of going back to the interesting experiments in Web3. There are coins out there that they have already been fully mined. Like they were set up in such a way that they've, um, all the last of them was mined like five or so years ago. And so we could look at those to kind of see to a degree, not exactly, what's going to happen when Bitcoin, the last Bitcoin is mined. What are some unique security concerns in Web3 development? Mm, let's see. So the main thing is that um, it can't, the contracts, the smart contracts cannot be hacked. That's probably the primary security concern because there is there's this uh, website Rec News. It is dedicated just to every or the majority of um, blockchain and decentralized application hacks, and I think the biggest one so far was close to half a billion dollars was hacked from an application, and so um, there's there's just got. Okay, I'm going off on a tangent. What was the original question? Was it security? What are the unique concerns? Like if I'm like building a blockchain app, what do I do to make sure my app isn't going to get hacked? Yeah, so I would recommend building it Reach first and foremost because it kind of has that, going back to that, it has that automatically generation of um, tests and stuff to ensure greater security and stuff. Um, but then going a step forward and stuff, I would, going a step forward, I would try and find like very security focused engineers, um, probably mathematicians. Reach is a functional language, so it's a lot more strict. 
um, but because it's more strict, it's more almost mathematical. And so you could structure, provided you bring in the right engineers, you could structure the contract in such a way to ensure that there are no leaks, in a sense. No one can come in and kind of break into the smart contract and take the money. It's not so much that we don't have standards yet, it's that, um, well, maybe it is because we don't have standards yet. I guess it depends on what you're building. So like the concept of a bank is pretty well established. Um, so if you try to kind of rebuild the concept of a bank within a smart contract, you would probably be able to pull from all of that learned knowledge and stuff to make sure it's secure. Um, but if you're building something experimental, um, that's never been built before, that there is no existing parallel to the application that you're building, then the standards aren't there and you are just going to need to pull in a bunch of smart people because that's, that's your best bet. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. It's been a great time. And I think there's pizza left over. So feel free to get some. We get part of that. How much do we get?